Welcome to part two of this introduction to the Rooted Global Village. In this session, we're going to explore some of the elements that comprise our body-centric approach to liberation work and why we value the body as this potent site of transformative potential. You might sometimes hear, by the way, um, the sounds of laughter from children coming from outside. They're playing in the backyard. And I thought rather than trying to eliminate the sound of the laughter, why not just welcome it in? This is definitely something of value to us and Rooted. We want to welcome all of it in. So anyway, at heart and in our embrace of emergence and unknowns, we are curious about what it takes for us to disrupt and even to agitate in sometimes even joyful ways. What can become calcified and habituated in our experience? and how this calcification can block liberation. Black feminist scholar Alexis Pauline Gums once said in an online workshop um, that I took part in, something that I've heard reflected in other body-centered spaces and rooted as one of those, but she said that, you know, the institutions and the structures that have inflicted so much harm on our bodies and the bodies of our BIPOC queer and non-conforming siblings, these structures and systems, they don't exist outside what we call personality and culture, they're held up by the repetition of the practices, the narratives, and the beliefs within them, which take on a momentum of their own when we don't recognize how they become embodied and embedded and recreated through us. I'm not saying that we as either privileged and or subjugated bodies are solely responsible for the harmful aspects of culture but that they can be passed on to us, repeated through us, or alchemized and transformed through us. South American scholar and author of Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Paulo Freire, talks about the magical consciousness that can take over, which is a belief that we're unable to resist, challenge, or transform what's experienced as oppressive in our culture. And this belief is nurtured within modernity, which often infantilizes us from a young age through the normalization of the idea that only the parent, the teacher, or the expert knows, and that we don't have access to an inherent wisdom or knowledge beyond what can be taught by our families or schools. Our friend Akila Richards refers to this as the quote-unquote schoolishness that we can develop as a consequence. Disrupting how we've become habituated to our lives becomes part of the work that we do, not to reject it all or to accept it all, but to come to a place of emergent discernment around what supports our personal and collective lives and what doesn't. And that's what Rooted is aligned with, the slow work of developing that compass individually and collectively. Disruption happens all the time in our lives and our relationships. It can happen as the consequence of anything that creates a ripple in the fabric of the habitual. It can come in the form of a challenge to how we know ourselves contextually, the death of someone close, the loss of an important relationship. Maybe you've had an experience of such profound and perhaps at times unwelcome loss or change. And in the beginning, all you wanna do is figure out how to put all the pieces back together. And in those moments, we might think that returning to the normal or the business as usual of everyday life is what's most desired. And sometimes the experience so permanently alters how we experience ourselves in the world that we can't help but be ushered into a reimagination of our lives and our worlds. Extreme loss is one way that we can experience disorientation, but we can also experience it through joy and play and celebration. The point here is not to assess the positivity or the negativity of our experiences of disorientation, but to consider how those moments could open us up to new pathways and new experiences of ourselves and others. So I'd like to say something briefly about a word that we sometimes use in Rooted when we're talking about how our experiences become habit. The word is orientations. Let's take a closer look at what we mean by orientations. So this for me is a unique perspective in the world of somatics because it takes into account not only our somatic narratives and our somatic experience, but also the influence of the world around us or the dialectic of us in the world. 
as well as culture and history and how they've shaped our lives. And I'd include the influence here of ancestry and the more than human world and spirit. The term orientation, as I'm using it here, it comes from queer philosopher and scholar Sarah Ahmed. Consider for a moment that through our experience of navigating our life worlds, we've developed habitual ways of being in that world, ways of inhabiting our bodies and relating to our worlds. The idea here is that what appears to us, to you and to me as quote unquote common sense, where our attention is drawn, where it goes, for example, and what, what is even you know, visible to us in a field of possibilities, these are influenced by our experiences and our experiences within, from within our families and our communities and our cultures, not in some wholly deterministic way to be sure, because we leave room for the ways that we're otherwise guided by ancestors, by spirit, by the more than human world. But as a consequence of being a relational being and learning to speak the language of a culture, we develop orientations out of a need to survive, or let's say, and to be intelligible to those around us. How we're oriented in the world can be inherited, imposed on us, chosen, or accidental. And throughout life, we make these perceptual maps of the world that help us navigate that world. Our cultural frameworks are littered with tools for orientation, such as maps and handbooks and textbooks. Um, we learn even in very implicit ways what should be important to us through our families and communities of origin in our schools and in other institutions such as church. So these orientations can be so familiar to us that we no longer see the, the neat lines that they make on our perceptual maps and we can no longer trace their outlines in our lives. And they can be comforting and they can provide roots and they can also be too small to contain who we become over time and we can outgrow them. They can also be imposed by institutions of power that actively harm ourselves and others. How we're oriented is how we identify where we are, who we are with and what is possible within a field of possibilities. This knowledge is in dialogue with a host of sensory input happening in our bodies all the time that exists beyond oftentimes conscious awareness. So I know that I'm home when I see the blue mailbox. I work at 18th and Elm, let's say. I know you're close when I smell your soap. I live by the ocean, so it's possible to see whales. In big and small ways, through our senses and through collective and cultural frameworks, we have a placeness, a psychic somatic location. Orientation in and of itself is a neutral tool in our navigation of the world. And yet so often it's divorced from navigation and presented instead as repetition. So we tread the path that has already been laid out. But we're not here and rooted to continue creating the same blueprint that we may have inherited or developed over time, but to come into a more discerning relationship with what is helpful and in service of life. Whenever we disrupt what is habitual, it can lead to our disorientation, which we might intellectually understand as necessary for personal and social change. And yet it can feel uncomfortable, edgy, or downright terrifying. And it can challenge the very foundations on which we know ourselves in the world. And it can challenge those aspects of ourselves that seek to shore up our sense of identity, our sense of footing, and our sense of control in the world. In Rooted, we recognize the potential for these moments to become the portals into possibility. I walk outside my front door on a late December morning. The sky is gray and full of clouds and there's a light rain falling and I'm smiling. I'm watching as children leave a schoolhouse near the bus stop and I have this feeling of contentment in my body. The world is good and kind, I believe, and I feel safe. The same day with the same flurry of activity around me can see me in an entirely different experience and an entirely different narrative of events. 
In another version of this morning, it's gray and raining, and it feels dreary outside. The dark clouds feel oppressive. Where is the sun? I feel dreary, which only feels either matched by or even a consequence of the weather outside. The world feels small and disconnected, and I'm somewhat anxious. What is the difference between these two of many possible perceptions? One way of making sense of how similar circumstances can be differently experienced comes from what's called the polyvagal theory, which offers us, and this is a framework that we hold with a light hand, meaning it's not a dogma that we hold to, but it offers us a framework for making sense of how what we perceive and how we make sense of what we perceive is connected to and influenced by how we feel in our bodies. Therapist and author Deb Dana calls this quote unquote story follows state. The idea here is that right now and in each moment, there are any number of influences impacting upon how we feel in our bodies. So the chemical environment of our bodies, internal signals, impulses, and sensations, as well as sensory input from our environment. And to extend this for us in Rooted, we could say that those influences from the intergenerational and ancestral and spiritual connections that we have. For example, I'm in the midst of my perimenopausal years. I've become acutely aware of how the shifting nature of my hormones can significantly impact how I feel and how I feel then shapes how the world feels to me. Something as seemingly simple as a drop really low in estrogen or progesterone can take me from feeling safe in the world because I feel ease in my body to feeling unsafe and ill at ease. Things like diet and inflammation, our gut microbiome, and all of their relationship to the unmetabolized trauma that we might still hold. All of these things can have an impact then upon my bodily state. And then the story about the day, about that person, or about my life that follows. And my state then makes me maybe more or less available for connection with you. The invitation here is not to delve too deeply into this theory, but to simply acknowledge that we are multiply influenced from moment to moment in our lives, sometimes by things within our influence and sometimes from things beyond it. And the key here is not to judge where we are right now, but to cultivate some awareness of where we are and from there to be able to make choices based on that, that align with our values. So for example, when I feel anxiety in my body and I've dealt with anxiety all of my life, it can change how I'm interpreting this very moment. So let's say that you were on video here with me now, and I was in that state of anxiety in my body. I felt anxiety. I might unwittingly focus with more interest on your body language, the movement or lack thereof in your face, especially around your eyes. And I may be more attuned to things that affirm the story that I'm not safe, that I'm not okay. So being in this state can make it difficult for me to take in any other cues that tell me a different story. Maybe the smile that you gave me or your, even your report that you feel connected to me. I might not even be able to take that in, even if I hear it. Without awareness, we can be captured by our state. And so others and the world and ourselves can become fixed within the story that follows. That is, without realizing it, we can fix ourselves and others in our perception, flattening them and flattening us in the process. A perception that we might hold at any given moment, it might be correct. It might be spot on. And it might not be. And determining either is really not the point. Rather, the point is that through awareness and through some practice of discernment, we might open ourselves up to what we don't know and the diversity of possibilities that could exist in any given moment for what this moment, what is unfolding in this moment. Possibility and choice are often what are shut down by trauma and oppression. And they're also one feature of the flattening of the world produced through modernity. Modernity espouses this idea of the one world world. This is a concept spoken by scholar Arturo Escobar. 
And this one world world idea claims that there's only one valid way of knowing ourselves and each other in our world. So countering what has become normalized in dominant culture and opening up to uncertainty and possibility is no small thing. And the question becomes, why are we talking about all of this here? Understanding the neurophysiology of our experience is just one dimension. As a body-centered communal space, we're attempting and rooted to navigate very challenging terrain so that we might disentangle from the harms that have been done through dominant culture that continually engender separation and division. This is not a small task that we're faced with, and it can produce discomfort and bring us to our edges. So learning to recognize our edges becomes part of our task here. We can thank our beautiful survival intelligences like that of our fight, our flight, our freeze, our collapse and appease for the important ways that they have kept us and our ancestors as safe as possible in sometimes truly dangerous, even life-threatening situations. The discomfort evoked by these responses and the uncertainty around the new can trigger fear and anxiety. And those feelings can shape the stories that we tell and the meaning that we make from our many moments. And we in Rooted are not here to tell a correct or true story about a situation or an experience. We're here rather to support and to encourage all of us as a collective to drop into moments of pause so that we might cultivate the ability to discern the meaning being made from those moments of not just discomfort, but also of joy. There's an ancient lesson in all of this for me that's reflected in many of the world's belief systems. So in Buddhist teachings and practice, I learned this idea that we might pause and release the hardened grip that we might have, that, that grasping that we might have on the interpretations and the meaning that we make from moment to moment. This is critical to our efforts to shape our compasses anew so that we might have access to a broader range of responses and sense-making of our moments. And that we may also begin to draw our attention away from what doesn't serve us personally and, and collectively, and turn rather towards what nourishes and contributes to life and the creation of new culture. I wanna be treated as a person fully in my permission to do what is best for me in each moment. And while I would wish that it would go without saying that others do the same, I did not always live from the perspective that I don't need someone's permission to do this. This comes in part from that schoolish culture to borrow Akilah's language, where we may have received very strong messages, implicit messages about what was acceptable and what was, and what was expected and what was not. An uncritical experience of this might leave us in a place where we feel the need to always seek permission to take care of our mental and our physical bodies. I thought about this a lot when my children were younger, how often in the course of their days they were attempted to be guided outside of their body's intelligence by very well-meaning adults who either um, would attempt to force them beyond a boundary, for example, that they had or deny them the ability to, let's say, go to the bathroom when their body communicated that need. These might seem like very small moments, but they combine to communicate a message that we don't have permission to make the choices that we need to make. We don't have that autonomy. And I really worked to help maintain this innate connection that they had to their bodies. We encourage agency in the spaces that we offer and rooted. This process and the work of increasing our capacity to be with moments of discomfort and also moments of joy and celebration, it relies on our ability to, to learn how to dance with the tension inherent in stretching from where we are now to where we might go next. And this dance means that a radical level of self-acceptance and permission has to be granted to ourselves to take leaps of faith. Um, to stay with the discomfort that we feel in our bodies or to do what we need to, to resource ourselves, perhaps to step away, to reattune our attention to something nourishing and grounding, to turn off our cameras, to get up and move our bodies, or even to disconnect from the space altogether. 
These are acts of radical love and self-acceptance that we encourage in Rooted. And with the idea that when we feel resourced and enough, and when we have given ourselves full permission to tend to what we need to, we are a little more free to take risks, both big and small. And in that experience of permission granted, we are, I think, more deeply at choice. And being at choice can be extremely liberating from the confines of anxiety and the narrative that might be telling us that we have to, or we are expected to, do something or to show up in a particular way. We need this kind of relationship with the moments that we experience in spaces like Rooted in part two, because otherwise what can happen is that the needs that we might have in a moment can become imposed upon other people in, the spa in a space that we're in or the spaces at large, as if we need a person or a space to be different than it is so that we can have a need met. Now, please hear me out. This is a delicate thing that I'm speaking to, and it's related to balancing our needs in a moment with the needs of a space. And it's delicate because of course, sometimes there are things that we need to feed, that we need to feed back. Um, there are things that need to be shifted or even transformed maybe in a person or in a space. What we ask for is the cultivation of a relationship with the pause, the discernment, and the discovery. So as a bicultural black woman myself, I've been in many, many spaces working towards a more just and equitable world, really powerful, beautiful spaces. And one of the things that would, that would bother me, that I would notice over time, would be when someone who would speak for an entire group of people when speaking a need into a space. So on multiple occasions, I've experienced someone with whom um, I have some shared experience, let's say, speak for all people within that group as if their experience is the experience of everyone in that group. And in the process of that, and without even realizing it, we can in a sense, erase the experience of others that might be unique to our own in that moment. So how we balance what might be experienced both personally and collectively might be, and what might be something for us to marinate with for some time is truly a dance, but an, also an important one. We offer multiple spaces and moments inside of Rooted to pause, notice, and reflect on what's there for you. There are entire spaces like Weena's seam that invite the opportunity to suspend the cognitive kind of meaning-making narratives that can sometimes eclipse awareness of what else is happening within us in a moment. Each month in Rooted, you're also invited to do this as an ongoing reflection, one that could easily extend beyond the bounds of that month's exploration, but also come to mingle and blend with your life and your relationships in an ongoing conversation that slowly transforms how you might perceive and engage with the world. This is really an aspect of the slow work we engage, which is almost impossible to quantify, but is rather the kind of like the slow drip of water that over time fills the tub.